All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, Dr. Cruz is away covering soccer and potentially being captured by the Mexican cartel right now is what he, uh, he last told me. So, so you're stuck with me uh, introing this morning. So we're gonna have a case on uh, shoulder joint paralabral cyst. Uh, Dr. Eric Laska is presenting for us this morning. Uh, he did his residency at University of Washington, did his sports medicine fellowship at Swedish, and then now he's back at University of Washington where he directs the, um, the uh, sports ultrasound educational curriculum for the fellows. And so he's going to hop in, uh, do a nice shoulder case for us this morning. So welcome and thank you. Thanks for having me, Derek. Uh, it, so exactly, I'll be talking about paralabral cysts today, and I don't even know if Dr. Cruz and I specified if it was glenohumeral or acetabular uh, three months ago, but I hope it was, he was hoping for glenohumeral. Uh, I have no disclosures, except that there will probably be some needless references to the New England Patriots and Tom Brady, as I'm a diehard New England sports fan, uh, wherever I can fit him into this presentation. Wanted to give some thanks to some people who have put up with a lot. First, my wife and my kids. Uh, I've got a third on the way and she's looking forward to when I'm done with presentations. Dr. Porcho and Dr. Henning, uh, they trained me in my fellowship at Swedish and pretty much owe anything I know about ultrasound to them. So the objectives for today's talk, uh, we're gonna review the complete protocol for a diagnostic shoulder. We'll discuss the normal and pathologic findings specific to this case. Note that it's not a comprehensive case. There's a lot more pathology that we will not be touching on and then compose a diagnostic report. So this case is about a 40 year old male beach volleyball player with 12 months of progressive shoulder pain and weakness. Uh, insidious onset, although he plays volleyball regularly, he couldn't remember any trauma. The pain was described as anterolateral, non-radiating, and mostly exacerbated by serving and hitting, uh, but also in daily life, carrying grocery bags, putting on jackets. So right when I hear this history, I mean, with the volleyball player and the overhead mechanism, I'm concerned, like label tears are on my differential, but, you know, rotator cuff is definitely higher up. Uh, then I see uh, an x-ray from before he got to me and he had a mild, mildly high riding humeral head. So I'm thinking again, okay, this could be a rotator cuff tear. <clears throat> and on exam, no shoulder girdle atrophy, uh, non-tender to palpation, normal range of motion, actually increased external rotation, but a normal arc. Uh, strength was normal too, except when doing special testing, uh, in the empty cam position, he had some weak, weakness and on O'Brien's uh, also some weakness. Hawkins was also positive. So now my differentials still favoring rotator cuff, but uh, label tears also on the differential. And, and I bring this up just in terms of thinking about what are we gonna do next? Why are we doing this ultrasound? Well, the, the patient's goal was to play in their end of season tournament in the upcoming weekend. And that's why they came in. They hadn't done really any care up to this point. And, you know, we don't have time to get an MRI. We don't have time to get a surgical referral uh, and to give them the best answer about, okay, should you or should you not go on to play? Uh, the one thing I could do for them at the day of was a diagnostic ultrasound. So a complete shoulder protocol uh, depends what source you're using, but we'll use the most recent source, Dr. Hall's uh, recent article. Uh, from the American Medical Society's Sports Ultrasound Curriculum for Sports Medicine Fellowships. Uh, this is the complete protocol. And the CPT code you bill with it is a 76881. Now, this is pretty familiar to people who've used ESSR or uh, AIUM guidelines in the past, but it involves the bicep, it involves all of the tendons of the shoulder, it involves the dynamic exam, it involves looking for at the joints as well, so the acromial clavicular joint and the glenohumeral joint. It involves looking at certain notches that vessels and nerves run in, specifically the spinal glenoid notch. This, uh, <clears throat> we'll talk about the things it doesn't cover on the next slide. And then also looking at the bursa, a few ligaments, namely the coracoacromial ligament, and then lastly for impingement. Now, two of these things weren't 
in the AIUM complete protocols before. And previously, the dynamic assessment of the biceps and subcoracoid impingement were uh, really optional for the AIUM, and the coracoid chromial ligament wasn't included in their complete protocol. So some of the optional things for the AMSM protocol uh, are the pectoralis, rotator cuff interval, sternoclavicular joint. So I'm not going to go over all of these, but we will touch on a few of them in our exam because with the differential I had in mind, I want to make sure I do as thorough of an assessment as I can of the rotator cuffs. We're going to look at the rotator interval and of the suprascapular notch because uh, the label tear concern. So also I noted that a few things that weren't mentioned in in the AMSM protocol that we do look at once in a while uh, are the conjoint tendon of the short head biceps and corpus pec minor, latissimus tendon, or teres major. So my approach, and I think everyone has a little bit different approach on how they go through these things, but the way I was trained in fellowship was to go from anterior to posterior, kind of up and over the shoulder in a seated position, uh, doing, that way I would not, wouldn't miss anything along the way. Uh, and always saving the supraspinatus for last because it tends to have the most pathology and you don't want to get sidetracked by pathology and forget to do your complete exam. So in terms of this was the order that I'll be going over things, uh, adding in the suprascapular notch and spinal glidoid notches uh, and going into a little more detail on those particular to this case. And some terminology I'll be using, uh, <clears throat> sliding, heel to toe, sweeping, fanning, uh, also called wagging, and then rotating. But in, in particular rotating, there's a few different ways uh, you can think about rotating. It can be on, this, on a midpoint, which is uh, shown here, or it can be on an endpoint where you rotate uh, with a fixed endpoint, kind of, and I call that hinging. So we'll start with the biceps tendon. And I think Dr. Hall mentioned, or someone mentioned in one of their presentations a long time ago that you know, when I, when I started out, I took all videos and Dr. Porcher and Dr. Henning would always tell me, make sure you take a video because an image, you can always lie on an image. Uh, so I do always, I still take videos and the PACS people probably don't like that. But when in my report, uh, I only include images and the videos are really for me to just go back to. So I'll have some videos up in the corner just to correlate with the images, but the images are what we should be talking, focusing on. So here we have the bicep tendon in short axis with the transverse humeral ligament overlying the top, deltoid superficial, uh, in between the uh, greater tuberosity and lesser tuberosity, the subscapularis on the medial side. I borrowed these images from Dr. Jacobson's textbook. Uh, and then we follow it down in short axis, deep to the pec tendon coming in medially. And <clears throat> our video, let's see if that's gonna work. Can you guys see the video? There we go. Now it's working. After, so this bicep tendon, well, we'll talk, we'll talk about the report for the bicep tendon after evaluating it in long axis too. Scanning more proximally on the bicep tendon, we come to the rotator cuff interval. Now I've switched up our axes here because two years ago when I did this study for this patient, I wasn't really looking at the rotator cuff interval every time. So this is actually from a different patient. But here we can see the <clears throat> supraspinatus laterally, subscap medially, and the biceps tendon in between. The coracohumeral ligament is over the top, and the uh, superior glenohumeral ligament forms the pulley that really keeps the biceps tendon in place. And with the new Samsung image, you can see that pulley and glenohumeral ligament even better. The subacromial subdeltoid bursa is a little thickened in this patient, as you can see by the asterisks. So then going into long axis, this biceps tendon looks very normal. It's not thickened. There's no tenosynovitis. Uh, and there's another normal video above, making sure to scan medially and laterally to see the entire tendon, and then making sure to scan distally enough to see the myotendinous junction. So in my report, it says no abnormality of the biceps tendon, which is intact within the bicepital groove without evidence of tendinosis or tenosynovitis. 
Next, we'll move on to the subscapularis in long axis. And I typically start most tendons in short axis, but this is just one of the exceptions because I'm already seeing it in its long axis while I'm doing the biceps tendon. Uh, <clears throat> so starting in this view, I've got my coracoid medially, <clears throat> biceps tendon laterally. Sometimes you won't see the biceps tendon uh, in, in one view. Measuring the coracohumeral space, uh, can be useful if you're suspecting subcoracoid impingement. <clears throat> Making sure to do a full internal rotation to see if there's any subluxation of the biceps tendon uh, out of its groove. And then also making sure to scan superiorly and inferiorly to make sure you see that entire subscap insertion. So in this case, the corpohumeral ligament or corpohumeral space was normal and there was no bursal effusion, no long head bicep subluxation. We can't say or give our full conclusions about the subscap until we look at it in short axis. Again, though, there was no abnormality of the subscapularis tendon, which is intact without evidence of tendinosis. Now this, you might say, looks to be a little tendinopathic given the uh, irregular hypoechoic um, nature right here, but that's this is a multi-penate tendon and that is a normal appearance for a subscap in short axis. And I have a picture of a biceps tendon here in the groove again, because when looking at this in short axis, you want to make sure to move laterally until you've seen the biceps tendon. If you don't go that far, you can't, you may not have seen the full insertion. So uh, the coracal acromial ligament is now part of the complete protocol. I never look at just the coracal acromial ligament without looking at the coracohumeral ligament as well. Uh, it's easy to just fix you, the medial end of your probe uh, on the coracoid and then hinge superiorly to see both of these ligaments. So here we have the coracohumeral ligament originating off the coracoid going over the, the subscap. <clears throat> Here's the deltoid overlying it. If we continue to move with our medial aspect of our probe fixed and moving our lateral aspect superiorly, then we get our coracoacromial ligament here with the cuff beneath it. So both of those are intact. The coracohumeral ligament is of normal thickness and it, it, <clears throat> the coracochromial ligament is also intact. And that is a thickness I don't usually measure. The coracohumeral ligament thickness is just measured if you're thinking adhesive capsulitis. Next, moving upwards and posteriorly is the acromial clavicular joint. In this case, it's normal, there's no effusion, no synovitis, uh, no advanced degenerative changes. Make sure to use your uh, power or color Doppler to assess for that. Lastly, uh, with some of the better resolution ultrasounds, uh, you can see a fibrocartilaginous disc in the joint, but most machines, you aren't gonna see that. And that's a normal, normal finding. So moving more posteriorly, now we come to our suprascapular notch. Uh, this is something, this is our first kind of optional thing we're looking at. Uh, in the suprascapular notch, there is a nerve, the suprascapular nerve, uh, and overlying that is the suprascapular ligament. There's also usually a vessel running in this area as well. We'll talk a little bit more about the other anatomy you see here later. So this is the view you usually have as you slide more posteriorly from the AC joint, not changing the axis of your probe. You'll see the trapezius superficially, the subscapula, uh, sorry, the supraspinatus muscle deep to that, your acromion laterally, and the scapula makes the up the bottom of your screen here. The, sup the suprascapular ligament here overlying the notch, and then deep to that is the nerve. So this was done with a, a sonocyte export probe a couple of years ago. And this is, uh, since these are both normal findings, this is just a normal video from a Samsung. So a little bit better resolution and you can see the nerve next to the artery, but using power Doppler, you're gonna be able to differentiate the nerve from the artery. So here there's no abnormality of the nerve or vessels within the notch. There was no atrophy. I say fatty atrophy of the supraspinatus muscle belly compared to the overlying trapezius. And that's something you're gonna look for when you're suspecting a cuff tear, uh, looking at the 
relative echogenicity of this muscle belly compared to the trapezius. And if I had seen any fatty atrophy here of the supraspinatus, I would also get a short axis view of both the trap and the supraspinatus. So now getting to the spinal glenoid notch, <clears throat> and we're going to definitely go uh, a little, into a little more detail here than I would typically. It also has a ligament, uh, they, they, but it's a little bit harder to see. Uh, and I don't think I highlighted it in my pictures, but there's the vessels still run with the nerve. And as to get to this area from the area we were just in, we need to sweep and slide our probe inferiorly and laterally. What's gonna happen as the probe moves into position though, is the spine of the scapula is going to, we're gonna to have to pass over it. So this video highlights that, meaning going from our suprascapular notch, then seeing nothing but black because of the bone and then getting to our spinal glenoid notch. And the way that I'm trying to do this is I'm thinking about the orientation of the nerve. So I've already tried to follow this suprascapular nerve in short axis, keeping it in the center of my screen. And that is forcing me to move my probe laterally. And it gives me an idea of which direction I'm going to need to move over the spine of the scapula to find the spinal glenoid notch. The other thing you need to do uh, to see this notch as well as you can is to wag superiorly. <clears throat> and that means we're bringing our probe up and over the spine of the scapula and then angling it upwards. And if we don't angle upwards, we're not gonna see that most superior aspect of the notch because it's gonna be shadowed by, our, uh, by the spine of the scapula and the acromion. <clears throat> so this is our patient. And this was the first view I saw when I was looking at him. And you know, I'm just gonna take you through my thought process here. I was like, okay, well, I can see the notch. There's a hypoechoic, you know, circular mass there, I think, but I don't know if that's a cyst, a vessel or a mass at this point. Uh, <clears throat> to orient ourselves, this is the glenoid, this is the humeral head, this is our deltoid and our infraspinatus. The labrum is the hyperechoic kind of triangular thing right here. Now, so how can I differentiate those things, a cyst, a vessel, or a mass? Well, the first thing I do is I use color or power Doppler to see if it's vascular. And so this was my patient and it, that didn't really differ. I mean, it doesn't appear to be vascular on our patient. Uh, and this is a Samsung image from a normal patient that just differentiates, again, the vessel from the nerve. And <clears throat> the next thing we can do though, to differentiate vessels from a nerve is to use dynamic internal rotation and external rotation. Now, with a normal patient, that should dilate a vessel. And seeing that vessel dilate, if the patient is in external rotation, you could definitely falsely call a cyst if you don't then internally rotate them. Because if you have them fixed in external rotation, this is what you're going to see until you internally rotate and allow that vessel to go back to normal. Whereas in our cyst case here, this is, remains relatively static. Now it can fluctuate a little bit uh, if, there, if the stock is communicating with the glenohumeral joint, but there shouldn't be too much variation in size with external and internal rotation. Another thing uh, to optimize our image, when I'm, uh, I'm here pretty much flush with the patient's skin. And what this is doing is it's giving me a really good view of the glenohumeral joint and the labrum, but uh, my angle of my beams are not optimized to see this notch. I mean, the, the base of this notch is angled upwards and I need to toe in medially to optimize that. And that's for two reasons. One, that's gonna get my beams to bounce back to my probe and give me the clearest image. Uh, <clears throat> and it'll also, um, because the beams bounce back, they have to pass through the soft tissue above the bone twice. And that's gonna give us a clearer image of our cyst or whatever structure is above the bone. So anytime you can keep bone below a soft tissue structure uh, and keep that bone parallel to your probe, that's gonna to help too. Finally, the one other thing you can see here going from the left to the right is that 
the patient's in an internally rotated, maximally internally rotated position here. So that moves our intra, our, our, it, it moves our tendon from over the cyst to kind of lateral to the cyst. And then there's less posterior, sh uh, posterior shadowing from that infraspinatus tendon. So all those things can help you kind of optimize your image in the spinal glenoid notch. And so this was, you know, what I saw and what I concluded. And I also have a short axis, uh, or sorry, a, a long axis on the spinal glenoid notch image here to the right. Uh, there was a hypoechoic, well-circumscribed avascular mass within the spinal glenoid notch uh, with a stock tracking from the posterior glenohumeral labral tear. And you can see the tear because of the way the stock moves right through the labrum. Uh, <clears throat> the suprascapular nerve was displaced superficially, and we'll get to that next. And there was no fatty atrophy of the infraspinatus muscle. And I know a lot of cases, the suprascapular nerve is displaced or, or actually kind of squashed down uh, underneath the cyst. And that may be why this patient was able to tolerate this cyst without any weakness or suprascapular uh, neuropathy. There's also, I also had a question when I was looking here, is this also another nerve? And I, I couldn't, you know, I wasn't sure. There are two branches. There's an uh, inferior uh, branch that runs to the joint. Uh, I don't know if it's shown in this image, but that, I wasn't sure, so I didn't, didn't call it. Doesn't really matter. So the next thing, focusing on the posterior glenohumeral joint, there was some degenerative fraying of the labrum and there was a tear at the uh, posterior aspect. There wasn't any glenohumeral joint effusion or arthropathy though, and this patient was relatively young, so that made sense. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the labrum, uh, the labrum move a little bit more than you'll, you'll see on normal labrums uh, in this patient when you, they go into external rotation. And just to uh, give you an example of an effusion, this is a different case. Uh, this is after hydrodistension. So this really just helps to show you, you know, where you're going to see an effusion in the glenohumeral joint and really show the lack of any effusion here. All that we're seeing a clear line of hyaline cartilage without any effusion overlying it. Next is our infraspinatus. Uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing here is you'll see the cyst. Uh, below the infraspinatus belly as we move laterally enough. We've got our deltoid here, infraspinatus short axis, uh, muscle belly, infraspinatus tendon. The difficulty here will be, you know, catching the most anterior fibers of the infraspinatus as they go underneath the acromion. Having the pa patients kind of extend, uh, or sorry, flex their shoulder and externally rotate, I've found helps move it out from underneath the acromion. And then switching to long axis, moving, making sure to move as inferior to superior as you can to catch as many of those fibers. Again, though, you're probably not going to see the most anterior fibers. Uh, so you, you can see those later when you put a, the patient into a modified crass position and you're looking for the supraspinatus. So essentially, this tendon was intact. So with some mild hypochoic heterogeneity at the anterior most fibers, and that was in this region. Terry's minor is next. So the key with Terry's minor in, in short axis, any long axis, I mean, it's originating from a more inferior position than most residents and fellows expect. And that gives it an angle uh, upwards that you need to account for. So finding it in short axis, if you try to scan laterally, this tendon is not gonna stay right in the middle of your screen unless you're also at the same time sliding superiorly. And so, so I, I find it helpful, especially when I don't know which way things are gonna go, finding it in short axis first, and that can then give me an idea of how I'm gonna to need to position my probe in long axis. So like I was saying, in long axis, this is the origin of the teres minor. 
to its insertion. So, so to place my probe on the patient, it really needs to be in this angle. And this is what you're gonna see. Uh, it's a small tendon. It's not hard to find if you know, I think the angle is the hardest thing to comprehend. Uh, but there was no abnormality of the teres minor tendon or muscle belly. And I still don't think I've ever seen an isolated teres minor injury yet. Uh, moving on to our supraspinatus. <clears throat> This is it in short axis. Now the keys with looking at it in short axis is you wanna make sure that you have your biceps tendon in view also. If you don't have your biceps tendon in view, you may not be medial enough. And you wanna make sure you have that medial aspect of the supraspinatus in view because that's usually where you're gonna see most of your tears at the medial most anterior kind of insertional fibers. Uh, <clears throat> there's a little bit of increased bursopathy here too over the uh, overlying the tendon where the tear is. Uh, this is the greater tuberosity. We've got our superior facet, our facet and our middle facet, uh, deltoid overlying all of it. When, this is where videos are helpful though, uh, because having only this view of the supraspinatus won't be enough. You also wanna follow it out to its insertion uh, because maybe your tears aren't within the proximal part of the tendon. So make sure you follow it distally enough to where that tendon inserts. And again, this is called the modified crass position. In long axis, <clears throat> oh, and I should describe what I saw here. This area, you know, on, on our first view appears hypoechoic and I don't see uh, really any true tendon fibers from the articular surface to the superficial surface. So I'm thinking, okay, this might be a partial tear, but I need to confirm it in, in my long axis view. And even this view yet doesn't necessarily confirm it because this is a common thing to see uh, some hypoechoic area right here where these fibers are diving deepest and that's due to anisotropy. So this is a good view of you know, correcting for that anisotropy in a patient with a normal tendon. And then here we have a long axis view. In long axis on the video, that's really to demonstrate that we're scanning medially enough to then see that biceps tendon in its long axis. If you don't see the biceps tendon come in in long axis, then you don't know if you've what, seen those medial fibers. And so this is our biceps tendon here. So in this case, towing in distally uh, didn't actually correct for that. And at the medial most fibers, we, we actually made that tear a little bit more clear. So there was uh, a small partial width, full thickness insertional tear in this patient. And that fit with their presentation. Uh, it was a small tear, 0 0.3 by, or 0 0.4 by 4 by 5, I think. Was, uh, and... <clears throat> Let's see. One other thing I wanted to highlight, though, is the articular cartilage. So people always often talk about hyaline uh, cartilage and cartilage interface signs with tears. Well, if your tear is insertional, there's no cartilage underneath this tear. So you're not going to see uh, a cartilage interface sign. You'll see a cartilage interface sign if the tear is over the uh, hyaline cartilage. And this is where the hyaline cartilage really starts in that tendon. And uh, this has become a lot more apparent to me as I've done more hydro extensions and you can really see, you know, where that insertion is and there's no cartilage underneath it, obviously. Just checking our time here, almost up. So the subacromial impingement, <clears throat> we're just looking for bunching of the subacromial bursa or an effusion. There wasn't any in this case. We're going to jump through some this is my diagnostic ultrasound report. It involves, uh, you guys can read it uh, later, but I've already went over all of it. I put in a scanning protocol in all of my uh, reports. I put my findings next, and this is just describing what I see, so it's not making any conclusions. And then my last page, I have my impression. And if I see pathology, uh, I'm usually including a picture of each of those pathologies. Uh, for the surgeons or whoever's reading it. Uh, orthopedic surgeons do a lot better with pictures, so anytime I can help them out. 
I always make sure to discuss the findings with the patient. And uh, even if I'm just getting asked to do a diagnostic ultrasound, I think that's one of the advantages we have over text and people aren't used to getting ultrasounds and then getting immediate feedback and a plan. So making sure to go over the options. And in this case, the patient uh, chose to have a surgical consultation. And for this, I knew my, my shoulder surgeon, I knew he'd want an MR arthrogram. So we got one, here it is. And it really confirmed our, uh, our findings. You know, it looked exactly like it did on ultrasound. So clinical outcome, uh, we gave her, that patient the option to keep competing until they, they only had one more tournament and they'd been dealing with this for 12 months. Uh, opted to, ended up opting to manage non-operatively, uh, move to warmer climate and they're still playing. Here's one other case with a larger paralabral cyst in a 60 year old pickleballer. Uh, <clears throat> this one went immediately to surgery and the picture that's supposed to be here, there it is. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to make sure you guys saw one really important thing on the screen here, uh, but we have to zoom in a bit further to see that. And so that was this, and it says Tom Brady, 2022 MVP. And this was an article from 2017. So I'm hoping that that's true. Here are my references. And I'll stop and take some questions if anybody has any. Sorry for going over time a little bit. That was a really great job, Eric. If anybody has any questions, feel free to, to uh, speak up or put them over in the chat and I can help moderate. Uh, one thing I will mention, just another uh, thing to con uh, consider on your differential, particularly with that last image where you have a pretty large cyst in that region. Um, one other thing that you'll sometimes see here is an intramuscular cyst that can be associated with rotator cuff tear. Um, and, and you'll see these particularly in these older folks who've got some degenerative change and, and may have a big tear. So if you see this, you know, this sort of um, image, that'd be another thing just to consider and trying to really define, is it, is it contained to that spinal glenoid notch or is it, is it leaking out of a, you know, of a, of a more, um, uh, a rotator cuff tear and then back into the muscles. And as those can be a little bit, a little tricky, usually a little more straightforward in our younger athletes um, with pretty well, well-defined spinal glenoid notch says. Definitely. And in this case, I mean, you could offer, for the patient uh, to aspirate these cysts, especially if it's of this size. But this patient, I knew it was going right on to surgery already. Uh, this wasn't even, uh, I th think we already knew he was gonna go to surgery. The label tear was pretty obvious uh, on exam. And we only did the ultrasound because I had a fellow in the room and it was really, we didn't bill for it or anything. So this was just for fun. Yeah, I think that that's a good point too. And we'd be interested if others have any other um, thoughts in terms of management, but we'll certainly aspirate these on occasion for, for symptomatic relief or whatever. But I have a pretty um, pretty low threshold for getting to go over to the surgeon because if there is a labral tear, you know, these are often going to recur and particularly if they have any weakness um, in, in athletic or active individuals, um, I think they probably do better with, with surgery. Um, but be interested if other folks have had, you know, any, any reliable, um, long-term improvement with just aspiration alone here. Uh, I see a question from William Douglas. Uh, do your surgeons typically ask for MRIs if they're going to operate, even if you have a complete diagnostic ultrasound that shows the pathology? And I would say for the shoulder, yes, because, uh, I'll, and I'll go back to one thing I put on my report here. Uh, here it says, no, only a small region along the posterior aspect of the joint at the level of spinal glenoid notch can be assessed on ultrasound, where we are unable to assess for presence or absence of injury along the superior, anterior, or inferior regions of the labrum. If you have a concern for injury in these areas, uh, an MR arthrogram may be more appropriate. And that's something Dr. Henning, uh, I think he put into his, into his reports when I was a fellow, and I just kept it. And uh, and I think that's why, you know, most of the surgeons, if they're going to be repairing the labrum, they want to know where all, all the labral tears are, you know, so they're not surprised when they get in there. So usually we are getting an MR uh, or MR arthrogram, depending on the, uh, sometimes a 3.0 Tesla can be enough, but usually an arthrogram for most surgeons. Yeah, I agree. And the, the importance there is really with, uh, with the labral pathology. You know, I think MR is going to is going to provide some additional detail. Most of the surgeons are going to want. You will see, you know, it's variable with just rotator cuff pathology. Um, I think surgeons are becoming a bit more 
keen to operate off of ultrasound findings, uh, particularly if you work closely with them and they can trust your assessment, um, particularly in the, in the more acute setting where, where there's not a whole lot of other, you know, other things, pathologies they're looking for, but a lot of that's going to be variable. It, you know, a lot of surgeons still just like to look at the MR images and aren't overly comfortable looking at the ultrasound images. Um, so they may just, just like to have it for preoperative planning, but, but this case, I agree. I think most surgeons would probably want the, the detail of EMR if they're going to go in and address the labrum. And I, I really like that, um, that little note that you put on there. I think that's helpful, um, just to provide that information. Any other questions? Thanks for having me, Madera. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us bright and early this morning. So we'll, uh, as always, get this posted up on the YouTube channel. And I appreciate uh, everybody joining us this morning live. Have a good weekend, everybody.